good at this Then maybe with a little practice I could tell myself to relax it Well, but then next time I try And even if I still can't do it Yeah! You know, then I'm gonna stick to it Yes! It's all about going through it And I'm gonna tell you why <coughs> Whoopsie! Whoopsies, I made a mistake and it's okay! It's okay! Whoopsies are what it takes to get better and better every day! Whoopsies, I made a mistake and it's okay! It's okay! Whoopsies, help me look, see, I'm better at this today! Woo! Whoopsie, 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 whoopsies! I'm a little embarrassed when I look at my drawing compared to this. I'm just not getting anywhere with this. It makes me wanna hide. Ah, don't be embarrassed. Don't hide. You should have seen mine the first time I tried. It took a lot of whoopsies to look this way. No one's perfect on their first day. Whoopsie. Whoopsies, I made a mistake and it's okay. It's okay. Whoopsies are what it takes to get better and better every day. Nothing to it. Whoa. Whoopsie. Whoopsies, I made a mistake and it's okay. It's okay. Whoopsies, help me look. See, I'm better at this today. Yeah. Whoopsies, wait. Was it yeah or woo? I think it was woo. Okay, say woo with us. Woo! woo. Alright guys, welcome. I'm Taylor from Rootkit. We're getting into day 13, which is wireless technology. So, first of all, I want to thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, today will be my final day this week teaching for you guys, and Elijah's going to pick up again starting tomorrow and covering networking and protocols. So, 
just want to talk a little bit about our intro song. I'm sure a lot of people have questioned it. Why are we using the song Whoopsie, which is a kid's little TV show, and why we have it at the start of our stream. So the entire song is actually brilliant because it encourages failure as long as you learn from it. And that's one of the biggest gates to fields like programming and computer science. People reach failure, especially early on, and they give up. It seems insurmountable. They write their first program and it doesn't compile. Or even the expert writes their, you know, their first program in a new language and they just can't get it to compile or they just, it doesn't make sense. It's a new syntax. Failure is okay. You're going to hit failure. None of us are perfect. A part of learning a new technology or a new skill set is failing. we got to lean forward when you fail. And you got to learn from it. So that's why I really do enjoy that intro, even though I did think it was stupid when Elijah first brought it to me that we're going to use it, whoopsie as our intro. All right. So first we'll go over our calendar here. You see that we're right at the end of computer internals. The dates are completely messed up. Uh, we are flying through it. We were really mistaken on the timeline here. But starting tomorrow, you guys are going to be getting into network and protocol. And then after that, we're going to start getting into some fun stuff. All right, and then we're going to do our normal spiel about who we are, why we're doing this, and what we're trying to get out of it. So if you go to our website, rootkit.org, we own the .org because we're a nonprofit. Uh, you can see our website here, which is, gives the splash page is a nice banner here for one of our days of rootkit, and then gets into who we are and the fact that we are trying to help certify individuals on software development currently and get them a job using our certification. We're not a boot camp. We're trying to keep it as cheap as possible for the consumer or for the person, the person learning, and we're trying to guarantee jobs inside the U.S. And if you're not inside the U.S., we are still doing our very best to get you a job, especially remote jobs. Um, we all. Hey, thank you for following, Bunny Killer. Welcome to Rootkit. We offer multiple different avenues here, so you can get certified just by taking our certifications, which we can see on our GitHub. And then we also have an apprenticeship, where you can come on over, support us on Patreon, and sit down with us weekly and cover topics that you have questions on. So our certifications are pretty basic right now. We're building this up all the time. We have a full team of volunteers and staff making these. We have our computer science certificate and our advanced computer science certificate. These are replacements for a four-year college degree in computer science to certain companies. Like we partner with industry companies and they give us a list of what they need out of a software developer and we make sure that you are an expert on all of those topics. So when you get to that job, you are fully qualified to start day one versus a college graduate who may understand the theory slightly better than you, but will not understand how to apply it. And we also like to teach towards cybersecurity mindsets. So while we're teaching software development, we're not only teaching how to program, but also how to write programs that are good and solid security-wise that can't be pwned easily. Uh, our tier two certification is made up of two tier one certifications, which these are the languages that we cover so far. We have our Python, Java, C, and Golang uh, certifications built out with more coming in the works already. Uh, there's about three that are almost complete. They just need a little bit more love. All right, then we'll get over to our 100 Days Rootkit tab, because this is the event that we're all here watching. We have a nice little blur about why we're doing this, uh, how long we'll be doing it, and what we'll be covering. And then also, on the right-hand side, you can see our FAQs, and we can see how to enter our giveaway, which we post on our blog weekly. Well, this week, we'll be starting, tomorrow morning, we'll be starting week three's giveaway. So this giveaway is closed for the night, so we'll be launching week three after the stream. All right, let's get right into the topic at hand. So today we're going to be covering wireless and mobile technologies. So just keep in mind that up until now, we've covered how information flows in a computer, what that information actually looks like, the format that it comes in being electricity, how we manipulate it through digital logic and logic gates, how we store it in terms of memory, how we action on it in terms of our processor and discrete structures, and now we're going to start learning more about how we can transfer data and manipulate data. Now, this is a brief overview and a great segue into networking and protocol, which will be started tomorrow. So we're going to cover a lot of topics today that we're going to cover way more in depth coming up in the following week. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so a little introduction to wireless and mobile device technologies. Wireless communications by fixed and mobile devices use a wide variety of protocols. So what this is meaning is, so fixed is 
exactly that. It's fixed in place. It doesn't move. And we have our mobile devices, which move with us. So our fix would be like our computers that can come with Wi-Fi chips now. But then our mobile devices are things like our phones or other small things like tablets or new, like the Switch and gaming platforms. Those are gonna, all going to be Wi-Fi enabled because we want to use them on the go. The protocol employed is often determined by the use case and physical limitations of the device or the environment. So yeah, the use cases of these devices varies widely. Your phone, you want to be able to make cell phone calls, so that means you want to connect to a cellular network using cell phone towers. But your phone also wants to be able to connect to Wi-Fi signals, that way you can download and watch videos in real time. And then there's many other devices that use different types of networks and different protocols. So the use case may involve high data rate transfer to or from computers, tablets, and phones, or it may be a low power, low data rate, Internet of Things device. So yes, yeah, what I was getting at, for our phones, you know, we we always want the best. Like if we're watching a Twitch stream, we want it to be 1080p, 60 frames per second, coming through to any of our devices that we're watching it on. What a refrigerator, we don't want it consuming a ton of power and, you know, doing a lot of things on the internet. So we go for a low power bandwidth and protocol for it to communicate, get updates and check its status and do anything that an IoT device needs to do, such as your fridge or your toaster or your thermostat. And we'll get into this a little bit more later and we'll cover about what the Internet of Things is, why it's growing and why it's not going away. So some of the more common protocols used by wireless and mobile devices that will be explored in this module include IEEE's 802.11, which is better known as Wi-Fi. We have Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy, known as BLE. So this is that like near communication. It's a very small gap, but we use it to connect to our headphones and like your car. Your phone can support that. And your car supports that. Then we have near field communication or NFC, which we've seen an adoption rise recently, where you can tap your phone at the cash register and use it to pay that's using NFC or near field communication. That's a very small distance that that information travels. And then radio frequency identification or RFID, which is a similar concept to NFC. RFIDs are things that like you use uh, for fobs to like get into a gated community or to like when you're at the hotel, when you put that card in the door and it opens up, that's using RFID. And then quick response codes, which is these QR codes that we've been seeing a lot recently in ads. You know, it says scan for more information. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into some of the use cases for wireless technology. So a variety of use cases exist for wireless networks. Technologies and network topologies employed can change based on what use case is being supported. So this is very important, like we said, there's already, just for your phone, a wide variety of use cases. You may be using it in a remote area where you really just need that emergency bandwidth and you're not caring about Wi-Fi. Or you might be in a densely populated like rural area where you want your Wi-Fi being up all the time or you need that high data bandwidth. So there's a lot of different scenarios that come into play when designing these networks and these protocols. So this change can be seen in the different types of wireless networks being used in modern communications. So now we can take a look at the different types of networks that exist. So our first one is Wireless Body Area Network, or WBAN, which is also referred to as a body sensor network. It's a wireless body area network, WBAN, is the smallest area of coverage. As the name implies, these networks include devices within the human body. Example as implants. Like if you have a heart implant that requires your phone to be able to set the tempo automatically, or it can send statistics to your phone so your doctor can easily read it from it when you go in. And there's many other devices such as wearable electronics, such as the iWatch, the Apple Watch, or Fitbits. They usually communicate to some other device such as your phone or tablet, and they monitor movement, health, and well-being of an individual. A W-band's coverage area is typically limited to one meter. Its purpose is just to cover the human body, and it shouldn't be readable by people to your left and to your right. You want to be relatively secure and relatively small footprint. So our next network type is a wireless personal area network, or a WPAN. The wireless personnel area network were developed to be 
to use Bluetooth technology to connect to devices without wires to an individual's workstation, making the workstation the center of the network. This is an interesting concept where you have your workstation acting as like a hub and all the devices connect to that using WPAN. Nowadays, WPAN support many types of use cases using a variety of protocols besides Bluetooth, RFID, and others. WPAN's main use point-to-point -point star or may use point-to-point -point star or small-scale mesh architectures whose coverage area is typically limited to about 10 meters or about an office room. So the purpose is that if you connect, you know, your Bluetooth headphones, because you have wireless headphones to your computer, you have a wireless mouse, a wireless keyboard, you're not tied necessarily to your desk. You can go walk to the back of the room and still be on your conference call and things like that. So we do see this used quite a lot. And it's really just a quality of life thing. We then have our wireless local area network, or LAN, WLAN, which we'll see LAN come up again but without the wireless part in next week's module. So a WLAN, or a wireless local area network, covers home and office spaces with data rates approaching wired connectivity. So this is your Wi-Fi, where you have your router in one room, and if you're in your kitchen away from wherever your router is, you still have access to YouTube and all your streaming services, normally just fine unless you have a really big house or an old house with like lead paint or something like that. And with Wi-Fi 6 and I believe Wi-Fi 7 coming out soon, these rates of Wi-Fi is getting really competitive with Ethernet cable LAN speeds. So WLANs also provide the ability for devices to connect into the network via multiple points of access. IEEE 802.11, also known as Wi-Fi, is the most common protocol used in WLANs. WLANs can support operations at all three layers of the enterprise design model. So this is a model that we'll cover in the future as well, but let's go look up what it actually is. And it says it contains access, distribution, and core layers. What are some of the keywords we throw in there? Maybe we can find a nice pretty picture. Oh, um, these are all kind of ugly. Here we go. So here we can kind of see these. We can see these multiple layers that they have here. So there's, they have like a five layer design it looks like here. So we have our level one, which is our controllers, and our level zero, which are like these devices that are you know, hidden behind it. They're your services. And then we have like our level zero to three, which they have over here, which are their on-site operations for what looks like a factory where they're running all their user control information. So their access to the building, how the machines work and everything like that. Then we see here that like level five is what goes out to the internet. So all of this could be wireless. As you see here, like this layer here is wireless. And so Wi-Fi really supports a lot of devices connecting and you know, scarce locations because they don't have to be connected via a whole cable. So WLAN's coverage area at the access layer is typically limited to about 100 meters, but can be extended well beyond this in the distribution or core layer implementation that cover a building or a campus. So yeah, so this access layer is what would be seen as one device, one router sitting there emitting a Wi-Fi signal and being able to connect to it. But then if you have a distribution layer or a core layer that connects many different Wi-Fi access points, you can build out that coverage area geographically by making multiple different access points. Hey, Toothmax. Also, what you can do is Wi-Fi now supports range extenders, as they call them, or Wi-Fi extenders. And what you do is you place them when your signal starts to fade a little bit, and they're basically a repeater, where they listen for the signal and they emit it again. So you make it your footprint wider and wider and wider to cover all the ground that you need to efficiently. So our next type is wireless metropolitan area networks or a WMAN. So a WMAN provides coverage over a large, larger area than WLANs, approximately the size of a city, 
metropolitan word here is the key word. Due to prohibitive costs, these types of networks are typically provided and maintained by a service provider and access is leased out to consumers. So a WMAN is like how Comcast now does their roaming hotspots that they have throughout dense, pop densely populated areas. So what they do is they sell you that monthly subscription that you use at home and also they sell like a little package or if your package covers it already, you can access those hotspots whenever you're out and about. So that would be a WMAN. IEEE 802.16 or WiMAX and private LTE networks and are popular technologies that support WMAN operations. WMANs are deployed in point-to-point -point and point-to-multi-point -point configurations. Individual links can be up to 30 miles in backhaul applications, but can also provide last mile connectivity to the customer LAN. So yeah, so a WMAN can go straight to like an office building where they provide LAN support inside that building. But you can use a WMAN to connect all those office buildings up over different customers, and they can have 30 mile radius basically. So our next type is wireless wide area networks or a WAN. We'll learn more about WANs in the future next week where we're talking about a LAN connected network over a vast distance. So WANs are used to connect widely separated LANs. Traditionally WANs employed wire technology, but wireless protocols can be used to build this backbone for the network, allowing LANs to connect to the backbone wirelessly. So what we used to do is we'd build these, and we still do because it's just the speed and the efficiency over ethernet, is you have two data centers, which may emit, let's say wireless signals out into their areas, their wide access networks that they have there, like for cities, let's say, but they still connect by a physical line because of that efficiency and that speed, that throughput that they're getting through that line. We can also use something like a WAN, where we beam that signal from point to point using satellite dishes and radio signals. There's a lot of issues with this though, being as like the cost of electricity, because you have to put a lot of power behind it to emit that signal, versus it going over a line. There's also things like the humidity, the weather, and other things play a part in that. Like if somebody puts a billboard in your signal, it's going to interrupt it or make it at least messed up. Those are things you have to take into consideration. The backbone is proprietary technology maintained by a service provider with access obtained via a WLAN or a WMAN technologies. So yeah, that's what I was saying here, where you have this WAN, the WAN, which supports multiple WLANs and WMAN technologies. So the key difference between a WAN and a WMAN is that a WAN link is normally aggregating or multiplexing multiple communications together and passing them over a single channel. So it's basically that bridge between multiple networks and many networks can hop on it at the same time and communicate over that. A WAN covers a large region and maybe even global. So I'd be using like satellites and other forms of transmitting networks over large swaths of land. Our final type that we're going to cover tonight is a wireless sensor network or WSN. A WSN is a group of dedicated sensors that monitor and record their environment. So this is kind of like weather balloons or thermostats, like maybe a thermostat in your pool that communicates with your th thermostat in the house. I don't know, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so these are networks built up of multiple sensors. So the environment may consist of anywhere from just a few sensors to hundreds of thousands of sensors or nodes. In many cases, the sensors are battery powered and must communicate using a low power technology such as Zigbee, Thread, or MB IoT and others that support operations for years before batteries must be replaced. So NASA has their network of sensors. Look up their deep space network. So they have their deep space network, which they call DSN. And what it is, is basically over the years, as NASA has launched probes after probes after probes, you know, they have the Mars rover, they have all these satellites in the moon, Mars and everything like that. They are using these satellites, which are just sensors, but in space, and are using them as networking devices. Hey, thank you for the follow, Chicken. Welcome to Rootkit. Yeah, so basically they built up this network of sensors, and they use it as a backbone to shoot signals out to further devices, such as the Voyager probes, and they hop across their different sensors. But these are all highly efficient because they care. They want the mission 
lifespan to be as long as possible. So they're prioritizing and doing as little signal as possible to get across that network. Yeah. So due to the typical short range of these low power communications, these networks often operate in a mesh topology, passing along data from node to node until data reaches its intended destination. Exactly like the deep space network. So, I mean, obviously these are very large swaths of distance between these satellites and stuff like that, but it's still relatively low power and they're using it as a mesh network. So it hops from device to device to device until it gets to a ground station back on earth. All right, so now we're gonna get into our major components of a wireless device. So while wireless and mobile devices take many shapes and functions, they share many of the same components. The following components may not be a part of every device, but several pieces may be incorporated. And once again, wireless devices, like there come in such huge varieties. We have something, you know, as like a Raspberry Pi, which can be considered wireless because I can put a Wi-Fi chip in here, like an alpha card or something like that, and take this with me everywhere I go but also my phone and then any other sensor like a weather balloon is mobile. So take this with a grain of salt, but these can be used. We're going to see a lot of these on our phones. So a display. Most smartphone displays are either liquid crystal displays, LCD, or organic light emitting diodes or OLED displays. On many mobile devices, this display also functions as the input device, touch screens. And I know we've seen a lot more different screens coming out, like the ones that repair themselves and everything like that, that we see at these conventions every year, but we're just sticking to the basics to cover it. So most smartphones and mobile devices also contain a battery or some way of powering it, but smartphones normally use batteries made with lithium ion technology and may or may not be easily removed. So if we go look at like the Nokia flip phones, they normally have removable batteries, but something like an iPhone or an Android or a Samsung phone, they don't want you to mess with that battery so it's not easily removed. Most mobile devices contain something to store what they're recording on. So mobile devices like smartphones require memory storage like any other computing device. They require both RAM memory or our primary memory for processing and flash memory for storage, which are found on the device. So those are, so we have our RAM memory, which are primary is for doing processes and having those programs running in our memory. Then we also have our flash storage, which is like our hard drives and our SSDs for maintaining that continuity over a period of time, our secondary storage. And somebody asked at the end of the stream yesterday, why is a hard drive not primary memory when it's like connected internally to the computer and it kind of meets some of the bills for primary memory? And the big thing that makes a hard drive or an SSD, an internal hard drive or SSD, not primary memory is the fact that they are non-volatile. So because hard drive's memory persists while having the power go out on that device, that makes them secondary memory. Because a key point of primary memory, like our RAM and our caches, is once that machine powers off, they get reset. So some devices may be able to access external memory like an SD card. Kind of like these Raspberry Pis, some phones or some tablets they have. They have these SD cards you can take out and you can just put it in and this one gives 64 gigs of storage extra on this device which is the primary storage on Raspberry Pis. So some mobile devices contain a system on a chip or a SOC, which we covered earlier this week. The SOC is more than just the device processor because it houses many things such as the CPU, the GPU, the display, the video processors, the cellular modems and other hardware functionality required for the system. Because depending on the device, if you want to connect to Wi-Fi, then you need a Wi-Fi modem so you can demodulate the internet, but if you want to connect to cellular networks, you need a cellular modem to take what is ever coming in as a cell signal and take it so it can demodulate it into what the, uh, the computer or the phone itself understands. That's the point of a modem. They demodulate. Uh, and they just handle most hardware functionality required for the system. That's the whole point of being a system on a chip. It's a one-stop shop for that device. So next, most smartphones nowadays have multiple cameras besides some of the Nokia's. But they, most phones have front and rear facing cameras. And the camera is made up of the sensor, which is the actual like light capturing device, the lens, which allows for magnification and the clarity of that capture, and the image processor, the thing that takes that actual light and turns it into data. 
So phones contain, and other mobile devices contain, a lot of sensors. So a smart device or sensor service has many sensors in it to give it many types of functionality. Some of the standard sensors in a smartphone is an accelerator, a gyroscope, a digital compass, an ambient light sensor, and a proximity sensor. These are used for a lot of the things that we take for granted, like how your phone can count your steps or know exactly where you're at while you're navigating a city street. By piecing together the accelerometer and the gyroscope, we then have our digital compass, which allows us to one, use it as a compass, but two, for navigation. Then we have our ambient light sensor, which your phone just does natively now. You probably don't even know it, but like when the light goes, gets dim in your room, like you turn the light off, your phone dims to not hurt your eyes as much. When you turn that light on, or you go outside, the phone brightness goes up so you can see it. Then a proximity sensor is used in modern phones to detect when you put the phone up to your ear so you're not pushing buttons, you know, with your cheek and stuff like that. Most mobile devices contain radio adapters or Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular antennas or modems. So mobile and wireless devices require one or more radio adapters to access the radio frequency, the RF spectrum, and the physical layer. The radio interface provides connectivity to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and other types of wireless networks. These radio adapters may be built into the sock or be a separate component altogether. We see that as in like a walkie-talkie. You can normally remove that antenna. That's that removable adapter. And you can swap those out on most antenna, or most walkie-talkies to give you access to different networks. It can also be an external adapter connected to the device. The device encodes data, modulates it, modulates that data onto the RF signal, and then sends it to the antenna to be transmitted. So yeah, those antennas and those modems, that's what they do. They're taking whatever data you want to, they're putting it on an RF wave and sending it out then they're taking an RF wave back in, demodulating it, which is taking the data out of that RF wave, and then processing it. This process reverse when receiving data. Do we have any questions so far? All right, we're looking pretty good, so we're gonna keep moving on. We're nearing the end of this module. And at the end of this week, you guys will all be proficient enough to take the computer internals exam and get that portion of our certification knocked out. Okay, so what is an antenna? So an antenna is a broad range, or okay. Restart. A broad range of antennas exists to enable a variety of network configurations. Antennas also come in a variety of sizes and shapes to accommodate different form factor limitations. So we're going to be seeing this in the future, but like we said, our walkie-talkie has that one that protrudes out just like our car. But then our phones, they connect over cell signal and Wi-Fi, yet they don't have antennas sticking out of them. So how do they have antennas in them? And we'll see that here in the near future. So. When a wireless device has an external antenna connection, the stock antenna can be replaced with a better one suited for that task. Every laptop sold today comes with an internal antenna that is typically located behind the monitor. This internal antenna only provides a small amount of signal gain. So this is how they get Wi-Fi. They have this wireless adapter sitting inside the back of the screen, just waiting and collecting that signal. But it's not great because it's integrated and it's spread out across like the case. So an external antenna that can provide much better signal for transmission and reception can also be connected via USB port. Let's take a look at some of these. Yeah, so these are pretty cool ones. So Alpha cards are exactly that. It is a pretty good brand. So what it does is you connect it to your computer and it serves Wi-Fi for you. They connect through multiple different types of connectors like USB or USB-C or just Whatever you need, you can make an adapter. But then you also have some here that are integrated into the motherboard. Which we can see here, you just plug it in. And these provide a much better signal capturing ability. But also an important note about alpha cards. We'll go off on a little tangent here. Oh, pack it. Uh, 
packet. So in order to do packet capturing or listening on a Wi-Fi network to capture other people's data going over it, you need a wireless card that can do anonymous listing. Now that's pretty hard to find in most modern day networking adapters because most devices don't want to hear all the signal. They only want to hear what is addressed to them. So if you take a laptop off the shelf and you try and snoop on other people's stuff, you normally can't. So something like an alpha card, depending on which one, you have to do a little bit of research, but definitely the older ones, they allow for anonymous packet capturing, which allows you to capture all of the data going over a network. Even if it's encrypted, you can see it. But if it's encrypted, you can't see the actual underlying data, you'll see the encrypted data. So this is super cool if you're getting into things like red teaming or blue teaming, and you're trying to look at your internal networks and see what's going on. Uh, a good tool for this is Wireshark. So you can actually see the packets that are coming over the wire. And for that, you'll have to place your Wi-Fi adapter in monitoring mode, I believe it's called. So antenna radiation patterns can be categorized into three broad categories, an omnidirectional, a semi-directional, and a highly directional antenna. Those are going to be important. It's going to come back up later, especially in our check on knowledge. But these are kind of vague words. And so it's easy to have misconceptions about like a semi-directional or highly directional and what they mean. So we're gonna get into these categories. So the categories are based on the antenna's radiation pattern. So basically how they emit signals and how they can receive signals. A radiation pattern describes the direction that the radio wave energy is transmitted and received. Antennas provide passive gain by focusing radio wave energy into a certain direction. The more focused the radiation pattern, the greater the signal power within the radiation pattern. So this means that the more directional an antenna is, the stronger that signal will be, but the less signal it's going to capture. So if it's doing a 360, it's going to have a lot of data, but it's all going to be weak. Versus one that has like a 1% gain, you're going to get a really strong signal. So in order to help with that issue, amplifiers can provide active signal active signal gain by adding extra energy into the communication path. Wireless devices benefit from both passive and active gain in both transmitting and receiving signals. So what this is saying is, let's say that we have a network set up of different antennas. They could have amplifiers on them, so they receive the signal, they see it's getting a little weak, they amplify it back up to its original value and send it out. This will allow it to travel further distances and stay clear. Because as these things start to fade, that data starts to fade. The device that's receiving it might not be able to tell the difference between a peak or a valley on a radio wave. Let's do a quick tangent and look at what a radio wave looks like. Okay, so here's a nice example here. So these are different radio waves by frequency. So we can see here that they have these valleys, or these troughs, and then these peaks. So let's say these peaks are ones and these valleys or troughs are zeros. And so this is how we would encode data on a wavelength over a period of time. We would set that amplitude to mean something, so those peaks. And so as this gets weaker, it starts to span out as we get over to the side of the spectrum, and data gets lost. So that's what those amplifiers do is they re-energize it back up to over here. That's an extremely oversimplified version. We can get more into RF theory at a later time. So now let's look at kind of what some of these look like. So here we have our WIP or a monopole antenna. This is kind of like that USB that comes out the side, or if you have a fancy router that has like the six arms on it, these are what's coming out of that. These work best for narrow range and can be collapsible. They're used in small radios and vehicles, so like your ham radios and stuff like that. These are normally flimsy on the end, they kind of stick up into the air and they just have a donut around it of its radio frequency. We then have a dipole antenna, which we can see is kind of like the same piece down here, but sticking out both ends. The two monopoles facing away from each other use to create a powerful signal in a restricted space. We then have our Yagi antenna, which is really common on top of like rooftops in America for getting TV and stuff like that over long distances. The so Yagi antennas are ideal for long distance range and directional application. They can reach multiple frequencies. So yeah, these are a more directional antenna than a monopole where it emits a donut shaped all around it in a 360, but not all at the top or the bottom. Yagi antennas shoot a beam towards its target. We then have our loop antennas, which work like a dipole and create multiple frequencies. These are commonly used for TVs and RFID systems that go like uh, rather shorter distances and are used in like commercial devices. 
We then have our bow tie antenna, which is another type of dipole because it has two. And angles can be set to work well with different frequencies. So the the angle of this right triangle here, this like uh, acute triangle, I mean, you can like expand this out to get different frequencies out of this. Then we have our dish antennas. These are commonly used by companies like Dish, which have like satellite TV or satellite internet and stuff like that. So it's being beamed from a far distance with low energy. And what it does, it hits this and it comes into this device here to read it. So it does a nice little bit of refraction in there to amplify that signal or collect that signal. So large surface space collects a lot of signal and it works well for higher frequencies such as TV and sound. So our omnidirectional antennas, like our dipoles or our whip antennas, ones that just stick straight up, they emit this donut shape, but not on the top or the bottom. So if you want best signal out of this, you don't point a whip antenna where you're trying to read it from. You want to point the side of a whip antenna towards the device you're trying to read from. They propagate RF waves that are perpendicular to the antenna itself, so coming out the sides. A vertically oriented dipole antenna propagates energy in all horizontal directions. This donut shape. Some of the wave propagates upward, but this upward propagation increases for a distance and lessens forming a radiation pattern in the shape of a donut, as illustrated below. Omnidirectional antennas are not very focused and provide only a small amount of signal gain. So yeah, so these are used for small areas, but you want the entire area to be covered, such as your house with Wi-Fi. So we have this router here with two of these omnidirectional antennas coming out, so the whole house will be covered. Then we go into our semi-directional antennas. So semi-directional antennas focus the radiation or the radiated energy in a beam width pattern less than 120 degrees. So if we look at 360 degrees as a circle, so it's one third of that. This focus provides for higher gain than omnidirectional antennas. Semi-directional antennas come in a variety of forms, such as a patch panel, sector, or Yagi antennas. So here we see some of these different ones. So three sector antennas, each covering 120 degrees, are often used on cell towers. Let's go look at a cell tower. So here we can see a bunch of patch panels emitting in every direction, basically. So that's how they're getting that 360 but they want the power and the range of having a patch panel. So they just point them in every direction. And whenever you need a new one for more customers, you just slap a new patch panel on here and you just pump more energy into it. So this is what a patch panel looks like for a smaller one. You can see these in like office buildings or industrial buildings sitting on the ceiling. They just make sure that everybody in that office building gets that signal. So here we can look at the way that a Yagi antenna and a patch panel emits and collects their signal. And you see that a patch panel is pretty directional, it has to be right out in front. And then a Yagi antenna kind of has these like weird little like sparks coming off of it, but it's a little bit more focused in the front. Once again, this is what a Yagi antenna looks like right here, where it has like these spikes coming off of it pointing one direction. So now we're going to get into our highly directional antennas. So highly directional antennas have a tightly focused beam width to provide high gain. So these are good for long distances with a lot of energy. You have to put a lot of energy into it. So common form factors are the parabolic dish and grid antennas that are on our rooftops. These high gain antennas are used for like WAN links, such as a point to point and a point to multi-point links up to 30 miles. The two of these pointing at each other can cross a great deal. Like if you have a burn line set up, Look what burn line is quick. So, I don't know about in other countries, I can only speak on behalf of America, but what they do is stuff like this, where they'll go into a forest and they'll burn a straight path through it. So that way if the, there's ever a forest fire, it stops here, it can't spread any further. So we use these commonly over vast distances to shoot these highly directional antennas down because we know that the line of sight is not gonna be obstructed by trees or anything like that. This is an excellent use case for highly directional antenna. They're used on weather stations and stuff like that as well, or like in like Antarctica, where you can have different buildings that are geographically located semi-close, but a little bit far away to like run cables and stuff like that in a harsh environment. Okay, so now let's get back to that mobile devices that we were talking about. Like how do they have antennas in our phones? How do those work? What type are they? We can see mobile devices typically communicate using a wide variety of technologies. These technologies transmit and receive on a diverse range of frequency. 
Each frequency range requires a different antenna to support the most efficient or most effective operation possible. Therefore, mobile devices require multiple antennas designed to fit into a confined physical space. This once again talking about how a mobile device such as a phone, we want Wi-Fi, we want cell service, and even our cell service is broken up over across the different networks like 5G, 4G, 3G, LTE, stuff like that. So it's to be able to do all those different functions, but inside the form factor of a phone. So devices with a cellular capability typically have two or four antennas dedicated to cellular communication. These antennas come in two, different, two categories, primary and diversity. A primary cellular antenna is obviously the primary antenna for communications within a cellular network in a transmit and receive capacity. So yes, yeah, so this is our main antenna for talking to cell towers, for getting our voice out and receiving voice in. There may be one or two primary antennas depending on how they want to do it and whether or not they break it up over multiple antennas to be able to have more than one phone call going on and how they handle the capability with that. And it might be able to connect to two different networks such as 5G and LTE in case one fails over, you can rotate or switch between two different cell towers. So because of the wide range of frequency ranges used by a cellular technology, the primary antenna is often nearly the size of the whole device for best performance. We see here that it wraps like the whole way around the phone, wrapping around to the two corners for our primary here. And this covers GSM or our cell phone. We do a quick look up on what is GSM. We see here that we have two different types, CDMA and GSM. So CDMA is code division multiple access and GSM is global system for mobiles. So basically what these are for is they are two different ways of implementing how cell phones should talk. Two different languages or like standards that should be used. A little too far. So we can see here that GSM and CDMA are shorthand for two older radio systems, also known as 2G and 3G used in cell phones. So we see Sprint's CDMA network is nearly 25 years old. And the first GSM network was launched in 1995. Those are aging technologies that we're moving on from. So the primary antenna is typically located at the top portion of the device because that's where we normally point you know, up and beyond our head. It is possible to obstruct these highly directed beams. So yes, yeah, so... So let's look up how it can be constructed. Let's see here. So radio frequency is always uh, is always subject to any kind of obstruction. So let's say that we have a network that's being broadcasted, even with a lot of energy, we can jam it. Well, not by me personally, but like militaries can jam it. Where basically what you do is you go and you emit a lot of radio frequencies in the same area across a broad spectrum of frequencies, meaning that the receiver can't discern what's the garbage that you're emitting and what the actual signal is there. But normally these higher, higher gain, highly directed beams are better at getting through obstructions, but they still have to play ball with if it. If you work in IT, you need to tear up. Good day, everyone. Um, Let's see here. One of the big questions that I get often when we recommend, though, it could be a mountain, could be anything. Here's the house. This is this is your property or any property. There's the bushland in between. It could be a big tree, could be a mountain, could be anything. So there's Darth Vader, and then on this side, you have the actual transmit tower. So it's the base station um, that you are trying to connect to from your house. So if you look from the base station. You look this way, you basically see Darth Vader and behind it, there's a house. If you look from this side, which is you, all you can basically see is the bush, is the tree, is Darth Vader. Nothing else you can do. That's already a problem. So regardless of what you do, 
that's your problem. So if you say, oh, I have a bad signal inside my house or even have a bad signal outside my house, that's the problem. This is the source of the problem. Now, if you then take a direction antenna, I'll just say this is a direction antenna. You put that on, suddenly a lot of customers or users see the problem. Now they say, well, I have a direction antenna, but this is going straight into that bush or that tree. That's not gonna work. Correct, but incorrect. With or without this antenna, that effect of the actual tree or the bush is already a problem for you in this space where you are. So by adding, say, five, six, whatever, 12 dB gain, you are adding 12 dB gain to what is a problem. So you will be that much better what this antenna does to not having that antenna at all. So you are just in this end-to-end -end link from there through the losses, this thing and what you get here, this is adding to your. Yeah, so we can see here that it's a common problem for having obstructions, which is also why we put these things up on our roof so they get you know, that clear signal. But there are ways around it, like increasing the frequency just to get more power going through it. And lower frequencies travel better through things, if I'm not mistaken. I think I remember that correctly. Hopefully that answers your question. So the iPhone 4 was the first mobile phone to make the metal bumpers of the phone an antenna. Revolutionary and rare at the time, it is now very common to fi find in high-end cellular devices. So yeah, our phones that we're buying now, we very rarely see an antenna that comes out the top like we used to with older phones. So many cellular capable devices also have one or two cellular antennas for receiving signals only. This is referred to as a diversity cellular antenna. Excuse me. This uh, alternate antenna allows the receiver components to select between multiple inputs for the best reception. The diversity antenna is typically located on the bottom portion of the device. This is this other piece. See it handles Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, and other things. So the Wi-Fi Bluetooth antenna. Most mobile devices support Wi-Fi communications and many support Wi-Fi operations in two frequency bands, 2.4 and 5G. Requiring, they each require their own antenna that support the type of the band. Because Wi-Fi is the highest frequency used by the device, the, antenna are, the antennas are normally smaller. Bluetooth communications operate in the same frequency band as Wi-Fi and often share the same antenna. These antennas are typically located on the sides as high as possible. GPS antenna, modern smartphones, and many other mobile devices have receive-only global positioning systems, or GPS, antennas to support location services. This is how we use like Waze and Google Maps to like navigate around. Due to the high but narrow frequency range of GPS signals, this antenna can be much smaller physically than cellular antennas. They're also commonly found on the sides of the device. So NFC or RFID antennas NFC communications do not really use an antenna as much as they use a magnetic inductor. An inductor is essentially a loop of wiring. When electric current passes through the loop, it generates a magnetic field. The interaction of the magnetic field between two NFC devices is how they communicate and how data is transferred. The wiring loop is typically found within the device, usually on the back of the phone or over the battery. So here we can see like a modern smartphone, they just put it in there underneath where the back of the case goes, and that's how you can just tap your phone to pay. And we tap the back of the phone normally, but they most, it works both ways for the most part on most modern day smartphones because they have enough energy going through it. NFC uses similar magnetic induction technology that can be found in wireless charging. All right, that concludes our final book for computer internals. So now we're gonna start our check on knowledge. Before we get into your check on knowledge, anybody have any questions? All right, we only have five questions for the night, so this should go pretty quickly and be pretty painless. So our first question is select every category type of radiation patterns that we covered tonight. Does anybody want to shoot those in chat? I'll be looking in our Discord in the 100 Days of Rootkit chat, as well as YouTube and Twitch.
Although I do have to warn you, YouTube seems to be like a minute to two minutes behind Twitch for some reason. All right, so looks like we got omnidirectional. Then we have highly directional, highly directional, and then we also have semi-directional. Because yes, we didn't cover anything called multi-directional, we build up multi-directional antennas via like multiple semi-direction or highly directional antennas, such as patch panels on a cell tower, and we didn't cover anything called a radial directional. So most mobile devices include radios for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular capabilities. We know this is true because our phones can do all of these things nowadays in one device. Select all the standard mobile sensors. So this is where we covered all but C, B, and C, C and A. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Cookies and milk. So I'll give you guys some time on this one. So select all the standard mobile sensors that we covered today. So these are all the components that we find normally in a smartphone or a mobile device that we carry on us, such as our smartphones, smartwatches, things of that nature, so even to include cars nowadays. So, we have somebody type and we'll wait. Yep, so earlier when we covered all the different things, we talked about how we can do navigation with our smartphones now. So, we have things like our digital compass, which allows us to show orientation. We have our proximity sensor, which is for showing when it was close to our face and whatnot, so we didn't hit buttons accidentally. We have our gyroscope, which allows our phone to tell whether or not it's being tilted sideways and whatnot. We have an accelerometer, which allows us to see how the, what direction the phone is moving in and how fast. Uh, things like our headphone jack and our SD card slot are not sensors. They are just ports. So which IEEE standard deals with wide LAN, or wireless LAN communications, which was a, well, or Wi-Fi that we covered. So they're all 802 standards does anybody remember which one covers Wi-Fi? When you're doing things like pen testing on home networks or office buildings, you'll see this quite a lot come up. And when you're in Wireshark and you're looking at wireless communications, it'll identify itself as this IEEE standard because that's how we identify communications coming over a wire. Because technically anybody that emits a signal can make up their own signal. They don't have to follow the standards. We just hope that they do so that they can be interpreted by our devices. All right, so cookies and milk things to see, 802.11, which is correct. It's one of the most popular used today. Our final question for this module is, which of the following acronyms stand for what is usually the largest physical network? It's a mouthful to read. So we see that our, we, took, we covered our PAN and our WAN. We then have our body one, which is a small area network. We have our metropolitan, we have our personal, we have our local area network. So our last one here is a wireless wide area network. Let's see how we did.
Hey, we got 100% our final module. All right. So if there are no further questions, that will wrap up computer internals and my week of 100 days of rootkit with you guys. Elijah will be coming back tomorrow to crack open networking protocols. I'll be pushing out all of the companion guides to our Discord members and our Patreon members. And I'll be standing by for any further questions that we can handle. Thank you guys for coming out.